Last summer, fragments of the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 collided with the planet Jupiter. With the millennium just six years away, the symbolism proved irresistible. The event was treated even by serious-minded astronomers as a portent of doom. When will it be our turn? Did previous collisions wipe out the dinosaurs, plunge Europe into the Dark Ages? Not since the Middle Ages had there been such an outpouring of anxiety about the end of the world. But echoes of the Middle Ages don't stop there. Though politicians still talk about progress and modernization, the 21st century is beginning to look more like the past than the future, a time ruled by robber barons and plagued by disease. In short, it's not a modern world that we find ourselves entering, so much as a medieval one. sounds of the brave new world, of test tube and decanter, of hissing injectors and gurgling blood substitutes. We are inside the London Hatchery and Conditioning Centre, and this is the fertilising room, an enormous laboratory where the temperature is never allowed to fall below 98.6. The future that we once knew, the future of the great visionaries of the modern age, Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, H.G. Wells and Fritz Lang, was a glamorous, dangerous affair, a world of great cities, limitless energy, mass production and technological takeover. Science would point the way and the all-powerful state would take us there, be it to paradise or to pandemonium. In short, gentlemen, the perfect process for manufacturing healthy babies. To defend uh, modernism, they were reacting against a very unsatisfactory past. Uh, they saw cities uh, infested with TB, uh, poverty, disease, misery, smoke, uh, and the idea of getting away from that, cleaning it up, starting again, was uh, enormously, uh, enormously attractive. We can't understand it now. We've forgotten just how bad things were. And that uh, clearing up, starting again, was uh, a tremendously important idea. Uh, in its uh, most elaborate forms, of course, it took on a kind of totalitarian dimension. Uh, the idea of metropolis, Fritz Lang, the kind of great uh, machine city in which uh, there's H.G. Wells in the background somewhere, in which little figures uh, flit across the surface of this gigantic uh, structure. Now the old off-the-shelf images of the future are starting to look dated. There never was a brave new world, a big brother or international federation of planets, nor, as is becoming obvious, will there ever be. We don't pop to the shops in hatchback jet planes. The common cold remains uncured. Space is still unconquered. It hasn't happened. Uh, we thought in the 1920s and 1930s that the 1980s and the 1990s were going to be precisely the gleaming chrome high-tech future uh, that uh, we talked about. Now, of course, there are elements of it there, but um, we only need to look around at uh, the crisis in modern architecture and uh, the general nostalgia for the past to see that in fact the future has not come about as people expected and certainly, certainly the desire for the future has not come about as people expected. Where then do we go from here? If the world is not destined to become ever more modern, if progress does not progress, where does that leave the future? Perhaps we can find the future here by looking back rather than forwards to the Middle Ages. It's a strange world but familiar too. There are echoes of the 4th and 5th centuries, of the collapse of the Roman Empire, of anarchy, instability. And there are resonances of the 12th and 13th centuries too, of plague, mysticism and millennial panic. This is the future that some foresee, a disinterred dark age, a time of confusion and fear, an era they call the New Middle Ages. It is evident that the word Nouveau Moyen Age is a metaphor. It is not to make us believe that we are returning to the 21st century, to the Moyen Age. So, why this metaphor? Because, in fact, it accroches the idea of Moyen Age to the idea of disorder durable. We have, finally, since the 18th century, in Europe continental, euh, vécu dans une vision d'optimisme historique et dans la conviction que la rationalité peu à peu gouvernerait le monde. Et d'une certaine manière, l'idée communiste 
poussé jusqu'à la folie euh, cette conception rationalisatrice euh, et extraordinairement euh, euh, construite. Et avec la fin du communisme, c'est toute cette époque qui me paraît disparaître. Je crois que l'idée de progrès historique va s'effacer. Et que nous revenons à ce qui est l'ordre de la vie du monde, c'est-à-dire un désordre durable, un désordre stable et un désordre qui s'auto-alimente lui-même. This picture of the future is very different to Orwell's or Huxley's. Far from a centralized totalitarian authority, here is a world, or at least Europe, in which there's barely any authority at all. The nation state has had its very foundations eroded by the sudden thawing of the Cold War. It's lost its political poles, become riven with ethnic rivalries, and overwhelmed by global competition. There are no nation states, and there are. It's like England and the Wars of the Roses say that you've got uh, competing leagues of of, uh, of parasites within um, each nation. We're getting back to a world which, uh, which is 15th century. The big question is, what is the place of Europe in the modern world? Have we got a future? And the second one is, is um, within Europe, what is the role of the nation state? You've got tribalism rather than nationality. You have uh, uh, some sort of shadowy sovereign body, which uh, which doesn't actually have much t much in the way of teeth, but which can nevertheless be respected as the uh, as the um, as the lawmaking body. Uh, that there are huge areas which are simply without the law. So what lies ahead? Far from there being a picture of greater political control, politics itself, at least at the national level, seems to be losing control to sinister new forces, forces beyond the government's reach. We seem to be entering police and political no-go areas. As the historian of the New Middle Ages, Alain Manc, warns, we are going beyond the all-seeing eye of the state and the long arm of the law. We are about to enter the grey zone. La phénomène qui nous rapproche du Moyen Âge, la réapparition de ce que j'appelle les zones grises, c'est-à-dire des zones où il n'y a plus de pouvoir, ni de pouvoir des États, ni de pouvoir des gouvernements, ni de pouvoir des entreprises, ni de pouvoir des acteurs sociaux. C'était le cas évidemment au Moyen Âge avec ces immenses espaces abandonnés, et c'est aujourd'hui le cas. Les zones grises, c'est quoi Je vous en donnerai deux exemples. Quand vous allez dans une banlieue, euh, difficile de Paris. Et j'imagine que c'est la même chose dans une banlieue difficile de Birmingham, par exemple. Aujourd'hui, il n'y a plus d'ordre, il n'y a plus de policiers, il n'y a plus d'écoliers, il n'y a plus de, de maîtres d'école, il n'y a plus d'assistantes sociales. Il n'y a en réalité que l'organisation de ce quartier de plus en plus autour de l'économie de la drogue. Ce sont des petites zones, mais elles n'existaient pas il y a cinq ans. Nous avons vécu pendant trois siècles à, en édifiant des États pour inventer de l'ordre. Et aujourd'hui, nous voyons des espaces se développer sans qu'il y ait le moindre ordre et sans le moindre état. The writ of the central state, which after all has been growing since absolutism in the 16th century, has ceased to run in very large parts of any one country. You could say um, so many, uh, so many tower block estates which are simply run by drug barons. In France, it's much, much worse. If you take Marseille, for instance, it's, it's. Uh, it's not a place which can be run anymore by, by, uh, by the central state. You have to come to terms with the local robber baron. And you could argue that the modern economy as it develops is going to be dependent on these robber barons. And you have to come to terms with them. Which means that the central state doesn't operate anymore. And you're back in that sense the Middle Ages. Now we're going deeper far away from the clean, centrally controlled technocratic state, far away from the reach of scientific breakthroughs and the conquest of nature. For here, another medieval spectre is becoming apparent, a spectre that haunted Europe for centuries to remind its citizens of their mortality, the Black Death. As smallpox and polio were eradicated, we thought disease was conquered. Now it's returning, not just AIDS, but a whole host of unknown microbes. 
we live a lot closer to the Middle Ages than we think we do. The Middle Ages was a time when plagues were everywhere and they were a constant fact of life. And indeed, we are living in a plague now. We're living in the AIDS plague. It's in slow motion. But there could very well be other plagues coming. At first, only gays and IV drug users were being killed by AIDS. But now we know every one of us could be devastated by it. But AIDS can be stopped, and you can help stop it. If you have sex, have just one safe partner, or always use condoms, always. There are large numbers of viruses out there, some of which are unknown and some of which we are beginning to know. And one of them is Ebola. Ebola is a level four monster. There are various classifications of viruses. The, the standard international classification puts Ebola at level four. That's the highest and most dangerous. The AIDS virus is level two. Anthrax is level three. If you want to handle Ebola virus as an experimentalist, you have to be wearing a space suit, biological space suit with an independent air supply. This is a military sample of Ebola virus. I obtained it from a source. I want to assure you that it's sterile. It's been thoroughly sterilized. It's a small piece of plastic that has a little black dot on the tip. That tip is a piece of, originally was a piece of infected tissue, and it contained about one million lethal human doses of Ebola. Ebola virus infection starts out like the flu. You have a headache and a fever. And then you get red eyes. This is caused by hemorrhaging in the eyeball. Then come brain damage effects. You get blood clots throughout your body, including in your brain. The personality is damaged or wiped away. Uh, people can become irrational, violent, psychotic. Um, there's a sort of zombie-like effect in the, in the Ebola patient where they wander around and they don't know what's happening to themselves. And then succeed the really major alterations and changes. The Ebola virus liquefies human tissue. It attacks everything. Finally, you get into the phase which is known as the crash and bleed out, as military people call it. And this is where you go into shock, and then in a matter of minutes or hours, you have massive hemorrhages from any or all orifices of the body. Uh, the intestinal lining comes off and is often expelled through the anus along with large amounts of blood. And death can come from simple loss of blood. People who have had Ebola virus resemble somebody who's been in a terrible automobile accident. If any of these exotic viruses got loose, they could wreak the kind of havoc the Black Death did in the Middle Ages. But if that's not a terrifying enough prospect, diseases which we thought had been eradicated like TB are now fighting back. The in invention of antibiotics and the wide spectrum of thousands of available possible antibiotic products made it possible to suddenly consider bacterial diseases a non sequitur, to, to actually think, so what if you have staphylococcus? So what if you have streptococcus? Strep throat, big deal. Take penicillin, no problem. Everything changed. Physicians changed their perspective. Parents changed their perspective. And tragically, all over the world, uh, antibiotics became all too available. What we now see is that all over the world, antibiotic resistance is surfacing almost in cataclysmic proportions. We have strains of tuberculosis that are essentially incurable with available drugs. We have now strains of a variety of different pr former great killers, bacterial killers, such as Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus pneumoniae, where we're really only down to one available antibiotic that is guaranteed to work. And there is grave danger, grave danger, that we will be back to an era within the next six to 10 years where diseases that were once primary killers on the planet will once again be primary killers. But disease is not just creating a more uncertain world. It's a symptom of one. Even scientists are beginning to see the world as fundamentally unstable and unpredictable when for centuries they assumed the opposite. We're looking at a long period of time from about the time of Isaac Newton until the beginning of this century, during which we thought we were going to fit everything into systems, into predictable systems. Isaac Newton gave us that hope by seeming to do that with the solar system. And uh, 
the assumption was that eventually the whole universe would be one predictable system. What happened during that time was that we tended to ignore, push to the side, those areas of nature which resisted fitting into predictable systems. Then about 25 years ago, this is a very recent, recent change, we began to realize, and I suppose it began with studies of, of, uh, of the weather and the way water flows, air turbulence, we began to realize that there's an awful lot of nature that doesn't fit into predictable systems. And we began to, to focus on that. And the extraordinary thing, the startling thing is to find that predictable, predictability is not the norm, it's the exception. This change has revolutionized the scientific view of the universe. Where once it was basically seen as operating like clockwork, a machine whose every move, given accurate data and absolute precision, was predictable, it's now seen as essentially unstable, poised between a state of order and chaos. According to this view, called chaos theory, the world is so finely balanced that the breeze of a butterfly's wings in an English meadow could set off a tornado in the tropics, that the global economy can be provoked into the wildest fluctuations by the smallest currency movements, and that the slightest change in social behaviour or the smallest mutation in a microbe's genes can turn a harmless infection into a lethal plague. Viruses and infectious diseases tend to operate on cycles of chaos and it's impossible to predict really what's going to happen in terms of infectious disease because you know this new view of the world that chaos as a mechanism is very important to the operations of nature now leads us to think that when a virus breaks out it's not really uh, predictable or even perhaps controllable there's no way to really know how the system is going to function until you see it functioning and so at the end of the modern age even science is beginning to admit that far from being the conquerors of nature, we are its cowering subjects. But there is another side to this picture of darkness, just as there was another side to the Middle Ages. To the saints and scholars of the medieval world, the hazards of everyday life were just the surface features of a universe filled with pattern and meaning. Behind the noise of material existence, they could hear what they called the music of the spheres, the sound of a harmonious cosmos in which everything has its place. This view found expression in what we now think of as the masterworks of the High Middle Ages, its great cathedrals, luminous imagery and rich iconography. Essentially, with medieval cosmology, there, there are two great symbols, two great images um, that dominate. One is of the great chain of being, the idea that everything in society is linked, uh, everything from the lowest peasant right the way through an ascending chain to the king and going right up to the top to God and his angels and so on. That's one particular image. The other essential image is the image of harmony, the idea that everything in society and beyond society um, has an essential harmony. Um, and it goes right the way through to the idea of the harmony of the spheres, the fact that all the planets are perfectly placed and perfectly proportioned, the earth is the center of the universe and, and so on. So it's, uh, it's a structure in which everything has a place, everything has a perfection. Contemporary science is beginning to find a similar harmony. There may not be a proof of the music of the spheres, but there are snatches of a tune. For example, chaos theory and the related field called complexity theory are discovering patterns that steer the behavior of chaotic systems like the weather. Patterns that are too deeply embedded to see with the naked eye, but which are starting to become discernible using computers. Unlike the iron laws of nature dreamed up by Isaac Newton, these patterns cannot be used to predict exactly how chaotic systems will behave, but they do hint at some sort of unity behind all the chaos, a still mysterious organizing principle, as it's sometimes called, that is secretly at work. For instance, uh it's very unexpected to find in areas that we think of certainly as not the same areas of science. The study of how water flows, the study of uh, brain waves, the um, study of how traffic flows, um, that there is some link there. There is a, a linking principle, and it seems to be this, this organizing principle that takes the chaos 
and makes this wonderful structure in it. This more holistic view of the universe is not confined to chaos theory. Even hardened physicists, the people who gave us the clockwork universe, are turning cosmological, looking like their medieval forebears for unity in nature, where once they would have seen only fragmentation. Well, during the medieval age, uh, there was, of course, uh, natural philosophers, that is, philosophers who took nature as a unified whole. They weren't called physicists or mathematicians. They would say that they were natural philosophers, the philosophers of nature. In the last 300 years, we've had a fragmentation. That is, we now have biology, physics, chemistry. And within physics, we have high energy physics, solid state physics, and statistical mechanics, astrophysics. So a tremendous fragmentation of the unified picture that existed during the Middle Ages. Now we're coming full circle now. Now we're beginning to have a reunification into a common theme. That theme is a theory of everything, a mathematical formula that will unify all the forces of nature and explain all physical phenomena. Eminent, sober professors look for the origins of all creation in the disintegration of tiny particles. They've discovered magic numbers like 10 and 26, which recur in their equations as the numbers 3 and 12 recurred in medieval numerology. They postulate the existence of a universe of ten dimensions in which all that we experience ultimately connects in a cosmos that lies hidden behind the curtain of material existence. I believe that if this theory is correct, one day someone will be clever enough to solve the entire theory and out of this theory will come protons, neutrons, the lilies of the field, the world, the black holes, the universe itself. This theory is driven by an equation one inch long, and I helped to write that equation. That's one of the things I work on, string field theory, an equation one inch long. We hope to find all the solutions of that equation one inch long, and out of that, we hope to get numbers that correspond to our physical universe. The mass of the proton, the mass of the hydrogen atom, the lilies of the fields, the cosmos, should emerge purely from math from this one equation. It's this cosmological side of physics that gives it such a medieval character. Like natural philosophy and the fields that unfolded from it, astrology, numerology, alchemy, it's beginning to look for the universal where before it would have looked for the particular, for the ideal behind the real. Medieval people saw particular things as part of some universal and only gained a meaning when it was part of a universal. To explain anything, they uh, elevated it to a, a context of its most general and universal character. Uh, they didn't uh, tend to give uh, much value, legitimacy, significance, or meaning to, to the particular, but the particular only really acquired legitimacy and meaning when it was seen uh, in the most widespread, universal, and, and generalized context. It's a visual culture. It's a culture where people are concerned with seeing meaning in everything, in seeing symbols in the mundane, seeing a relationship between everyday matter and spiritual reality, spiritual reality represented, obviously, uh, by God and by the Christian religion. The big difference, of course, between medieval theology and modern physics is that the latter must still find its ultimate vindication from experimentation. This is why scientists need huge machines to rip atoms to pieces and inspect their entrails. But there's a twist to this tale. The theories have become so elaborate, so vast in their scope, so microscopic in their detail, that the machines needed to test them are becoming too expensive to build. The Dallas-based superconducting supercollider was to be just such a machine until, to the dismay of most physicists, the US Congress decided to cancel it. We're entering a dangerous period, a period quite similar to the Middle Ages when there were no checks on monks uh, writing musical scores for the music of the spheres and the harmony of the universe. So we theoretical physicists, for at least 30 years now into the future, will be creating perfect universes, perhaps universes that don't even exist. The only check on us will be mathematical consistency, perfection, harmony. That will be the only check on theoretical physicists because of the cancellation of that huge atom smasher outside Dallas, Texas. 
The music of the spheres, the harmony of the universe. It's a world in which order is not imposed but spontaneously emerges. Here everything is filled with unexpected meanings, surprising connections. For example, what's this? Internet. A mushroom cloud. What links nuclear Armageddon with the information superhighway, the Third World War with the global village? The Internet began life as an experimental system set up by the Pentagon to link together the nuclear research facilities scattered across America. For defence rather than democratic reasons, it was controlled not centrally but collectively, so it would be less vulnerable to missile attack. It's that lack of control that turned the Internet into the global unruly sprawl it is today, and the perfect environment for a new form of communication. Information can be instantly sent from anywhere to anyone, Messages are composed on word processors and sent over the line to their destination, where they can be copied, edited, annotated and forwarded to others, and so on like a chain letter, spreading further and wider until it loses its relevance and disappears. It reminds you of the medieval habit of communicating, especially communicating among, among scholars by letter, except speed it up uh, by several orders of magnitude. But more especially, it's very like the way a medieval text would accumulate commentaries as it passed along. If you've ever seen a manuscript that it seems to be totally surrounded by marginal commentary that seems to be interleaved with marginal commentary, that's very like the progress of an idea through one of the conversation groups on the internet. In short, the internet is being taken by the growing number of people who embrace it, enjoy it, hail it, and yes, hype it, as the shape of things to come. It provides us with a way of escaping the black and white prison of print and entering a colorful new universe of multimedia with its rich palette of pictures, sounds, animations, and icons. Five billion years from now, the sun will swell to 100 times its present size, engulfing the planets nearest to it. The whole point about print culture is that it tends not to see, or has not tended to see, uh, so very relatively recently, connections with the visual. I mean, illustrations in books, until relatively recently, were literally that. They were illustrations. They were not an integral part of the commentary. Now, the medieval mind would have had no difficulty with shifting in that way. In fact, if you look at some of the religious imagery of the Middle Ages, it chops and changes. It jumps from mystery plays and into sermon literature, into manuscripts and back again. Indeed, if you look at a medieval manuscript, what's going on in the margin is often as interesting as what's going on in the main picture. That happens all the time in video games, in a, a, a game like Myst. Where you're forever taking alphabetic signals and then chain, then finding out that the secret in the innermost sanctum sanctorum is a book, and you try to figure out, open the book, and so on, and, 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 and get that, that way. Um, if you add to that what, for a medieval reader, was so assumed, that we never talked about much, which is the, the, in, the voice, the, the embodied voice, you get something very like a, a modern, a multimedia book. Live. An apple, the symbol of knowledge, but also now the logo of one of the world's most successful computer companies, indeed the company that claims to have designed the first computer that could truly claim to be personal, the Macintosh. The thing that made the Mac personal, friendly, was the design of its screen. Rather than expect the user to learn meaningless programming statements, the Mac's designers returned to the medieval language of simple images and visual cues, representing the computer's functions using little pictures called icons. The inspiration for this design came from a technique used by medieval storytellers to memorise lengthy sagas and complicated concepts. They too needed to use images rather than words to tell their tales. To do so, they'd create what they called a memory theatre or memory palace, an imaginary space filled with objects and symbols representing the ideas and events they wanted to communicate. Now, when people tried to figure out how to work to design a computer screen, one of the things that they thought about was that they could make a memory theatre of the desk. 
because the desk is where we work, do the work that now goes on in the computer. So the desktop will be a memory palace. And over here, we'll have a trash basket, because that's where the trash basket is in your office. And here we will have the text. And here we will have uh, uh, an, an, an ability to call up this particular program. So you would take the design of a text, and you would make of it a series of icons. And that's what we have, at least in the, in the Macintosh world that I live in, and increasingly in the, in the Windows world uh, as well. You have a radical mixture of icons and words. If this world of images and information, signs and symbols, cosmology and chaos is really the one we're destined to live in, we have to rethink the way we look at our world and its future. The old image of the metropolis must give way to a new one, a much more benign picture of a medieval town, a place not of alienation, but of ideas. The early 20th century city uh, was a place where uh, large numbers of clerks uh, came to take their place in these uh, great boxes, these uh, faceless boxes, uh, dehumanized, uh, treated as machines, not sharing any information, simply handling it. All that handling is now achievable electronically. What remains is what that information can actually become. In other words, creativity and invention the exchange of ideas. And curiously, this is something that justifies the existence of cities, not bringing large numbers of clerks together, millions of people on 19th century uh, infrastructure in order to get access to 21st century technology, which is uh, the present transitional situation. It is those people who uh, want ideas, who want to develop ideas in contact with the best other minds of their kind, who are capable of using the city in an inventive, creative, flexible, uh, non-9 to 5, non-5 day week, utterly undeconventionalized creative way. And that, I believe, has echoes of what cities were in the past. And while we meet to exchange ideas in the city, we work to create them at home, far, far away from the anonymous fish tanks or open plan hutches of the modern age, in an environment that feeds our imaginations, stretches our minds, and pampers our senses. An image of that is in that uh, uh, wonderful picture of St. Jerome, in which the intellectual St. Jerome sits in a study uh, within a great uh, framework, architectural framework, punctured with the visions of this wonderful landscape outside. And uh, that saint is in control of his own destiny. He has his own uh, books, information, data around him and his own pets, his own pieces, his own identity. We've been here before. In the 19th century too, there was a yearning to recover the Gothic world of cathedrals and chivalry. The legacy of that yearning is all around us, in the grandeur of Pugin's designs for the Houses of Parliament and in Victorian interior decoration. We have this vision of the Victorians as being uh, great optimists, great planners, great builders, great creators. But at the heart of all of that, there was a, there was a fundamental fear, a sort, of, a sort of nightmare in the middle of the night, that the Industrial Revolution and all its works were destroying social structures. Capitalism was destroying all that had been good and fine and noble about previous cultures. And that's why the Victorians had such a love affair with the Middle Ages, because it was an attempt to get back to a sense of community, uh, a sense of uh, order. <laughs> This time it's different. For both the doomsayers of the new dark ages and the prophets of a new medievalism, the Middle Ages represent a way of confronting the future. The Victorians, in contrast, were looking to the pre-industrial past as a way of escaping it. I'm not fond of, of, of romanticizing the Middle Ages in the 19th century William Morris age either. I don't want to go back to the bathless age of uh, uh, as Mark Twain called it, where uh, I, for example, would be blind and also have no teeth. Um, so we're not talking about that kind of naive romanticism. Um, I think there are ways in which, if we are returning to some patterns of medieval experience, it's not a bad idea. I think the rich signal and the new kind of reading and literacy. It's kind of interesting, I think. It's up for grabs. There will be the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. I think the potential opportunities are that you have a society where people are more visually aware and where they see connections more. And that, I think, is one of the ways 
in which we may be able to square in the 21st century the circle between a society where knowledge becomes more and more specialist and therefore less accessible to the majority of people and at the same time uh, the need to communicate that knowledge to a broad selection of people. If you're dealing in a culture which is used to jumping around in media and used to making connections, used to making big ideas as the late Middle Ages was and as possibly the new Middle Ages maybe, then I think it's going to be much easier to make those connections without worrying about everything being put in separate compartments and nobody really understanding the whole. I think the power of information to make people free, uh, to be able to choose how they conduct their lives, what kind of timetable they have, whom they talk to, what ideas they deal with, what creativity they should have, becomes possible. Now, maybe there's going to be a physical correlate, correlate of that uh, freedom uh, which information technology brings, and maybe there will be echoes in that freedom of the kind of sweetness and beauty and order of the medieval city. Whatever vision we might have of the next millennium as a dark, dangerous crypt or a dynamic, colourful memory palace, the future looks uncertain. Perhaps the dangers of the new dark ages means that we have no future at all. But perhaps the promise of a new medievalism means that for the first time since the dawn of the modern age, we have a destiny instead. <laughs>